What's good, YouTube? Andy Malfrina here. Intro suck dick, so I'm going to make this as quick as possible. Right here, this video, I got Derek Bloom. You guys know him from uh, If I Die First, The Color of Violence, From First to Last, Drumming and All Those Bitches. This is going to be a good-ass interview. I had a lot of fun doing it, and I think you're going to have a lot of fun watching it. Um, so... Yeah, I just I'm making this I'm making this uh, intro just to let you all know. I sort of like got this intro randomly. I was I posted a video about uh, if I die first. Derek saw I was like big up and Derek in the video. He saw that video, tweeted about it, said thank you. I was like, oh shit, I really like your band. Got the interview, and then um and then I got another interview, and I got a couple interviews, and I'm like, well, I should like make a thing. To post these interviews. So I decided I started a podcast called Versus Andy Malfrina. This is going to be the first episode. It's going to sound a little weird because I didn't expect to do this podcast. But after thinking about it, I now set up the podcast. So if you enjoy this and you enjoy me and you think I ask questions hella good, go look up on iTunes Versus Andy Malfrina every week. Um, well, hopefully every week, this is a new thing. So I'm going to be trying my hardest to, uh, get these out every week, but most weeks you'll hear me, Andy Malfarina interviewing someone I think is cool. So if you end up liking this, go check that out. All right. I'm taking up enough of you. I'll take up. An, I will stop talking is what I'm trying to say. I love you. Thank you for watching this. All right, and we're recording. What is good? This is uh, Andy Malafrina, and I'll just get right into it. I'm very excited. I got a special guest, probably, I think, my first interview on this uh, new YouTube channel. And, um, yeah, very excited to get into it. You may know him from uh, if, I Die Ver if I Die First, The uh, Color of Violence, and uh, from first to last, I'm very excited to introduce Derek Bloom on the Zoom Hi. chat. What's Thank good, brother? You How you been? Good, man. Just uh, busy, I guess, lately. Kind of learning, uh, you know, all the uh, songs, Get trying to get show ready. and. Uh, uh, okay, cool. That. That, so that's actually an interesting place um, I wanted to start because I do have a lot of questions about If I Die First, but I was like listening to, I was like listening to the tracks and like hearing your drumming on Oh, it's such a, it's such a long title. I forget uh, the my nightmares. Uh, do we'll a do number, number. Yeah, we we'll do numbers yeah. on you. <laughs> I listen to the song a bunch, but I'm just I'm bad at remembering song titles for any band. But um, I like hearing that one, and then going back to your uh your your EP that you guys dropped. I was like, oh wait, I don't think he drummed on the. I don't think he was playing drums on these yeah. original songs. Yeah. I, uh, I joined up after that had been out for a little bit. Uh, I joined kind of in the middle of the uh, the writing and recording of this new Space Cowboy split, and oh. so uh, so I didn't I didn't play drums on the collaborative song uh, Sal did, and then I played drums on our two songs on the oh. S. Okay, cool. So how did um. How did how did it come up? How did it come up that they wanted you to be in the band? You know, um, I they had uh, had another drummer, and I think that in anticipation for tour and stuff, um, I you know, and maybe somebody will correct me if I don't have the information right. But I think they were just trying to get ahead of the fact that the drummer that they had before Kale, uh, who's Ghost Main's tour drummer. You know, and so they were just looking at like how how realistic is it that if he's touring full time that we'll get any time to tour. Um, and so I was not really doing uh, I didn't have any musical obligations at the time. And me and Travis have stayed very close, like always working on COV stuff and kind of. Uh, with FFTL, you know, coming back from the dead in the last couple of years and doing some shows and stuff, we've been in a lot more contact. And now me and Travis are even neighbors. <laughs> and so, oh, uh, oh and really? So, you guys are neighbors? That yeah. makes things a lot easier. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so, uh, and so it just, I, I think to him felt like an obvious choice. So like, Hey, why don't I see if Derek wants to do this? And, you know, I haven't really been interested in getting serious for anything with music for a really long time. And, uh, I, f I feel like, uh, with the pandemic and everything, throwing my normal work into kind of chaos, it just felt like a perfect time to go back and kind of, um, just go full into to music again, 
you uh, know? Yeah. So the, okay. So the pandemic sort of really altered what work was for you. So now you're kind of looking at it like, Hey man, my, I mean, it's already kind of a little thrown out of whack. Might as well go back into a band again. Well, yeah, I think like, you know, the first time around when FFTL ended and stuff, uh, I think it was like a really, um, a difficult period, uh, for, for me, uh, like not like it was any harder for me than it was for anybody else in the band, but I think I took it very hard because, you know, you get used to, we were very lucky with that band. Everything just took off as soon as it started, you know, and, uh, the, we, the timing was great, but, uh, it just, it sort of blew up really fast and then blew apart just as fast. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then it was like uh, trying to pick up the pieces for a long time. And I think just, uh, I was a little uh, dissatisfied with uh, the way that things kind of ended and, and the way that I hadn't maybe taken advantage of getting to meet as many people as I had and make, better connections in the industry and kind of uh do you know do stuff like that network a little bit better and stuff um so i was kind of a little disappointed in that and when it ended it was just like that's it <laughs> like no there's nobody calling there's nobody nothing going on there's no money there's you know and so i took a really long break and kind of was really burnt out and got a normal job for a while and um and did that for years and uh and then that kind of uh, the pandemic happened and that fell apart and, and to me it was like i've been doing this stuff that I didn't even want to do in the first place but that was sort of like i'll do this to have a stable life and not have to go through all of this again you know and yeah. then it happened and then it happened again in the pandemic and i lost my job and lost all my stuff and so i think my brain just snapped and i was like all right well i'm just never gonna do anything that i don't want to do yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I I did I did what I what everybody told me I should do and I followed all the rules and I did all this stuff and I lost everything anyway. So now I'm just only gonna do what I exactly what I wanted to do. But yeah. It's, just, you know. it's kind of funny because it's like you you fall you followed the dream and then that had like a whole like it's all going away and then you tried the you tried out the fucking normal nine to five and then that and you're like I might as well be having if it's all just gonna go away yeah. I might as well just have fun. I feel like lucky that it happened so succinctly in this one year. <laughs> you yeah. Know I mean? All of these realizations and all of these things. And, I, and then I had the luxury of the time uh, alone to sit and like do all of that, um, you know, I guess inner monologuing and stuff and kind of working through all of that stuff. Yeah. I, I was, just, I was uh, si similar things too. Cause you just have, you know, you can't my I because I work in uh, I do like warehouse work and like construct construction type stuff. So my stuff didn't really stop that much, but you can't go out and do much. And you do you really just have more time to like think about things and just be more introspective. And it kind of gives you, you know, maybe that stuff you were putting off that you should have been sort of like that mental health stuff you put off you should have been working on or whatever, or yeah. things like that, it, like take more time to uh assess that and stuff um when you were i i didn't think about that when you brought it up earlier like being in from first to last was probably rocky and stressful because it made because i've been it, it almost made me think of like like it's similar to like a band like dance gavin dance where they couldn't go an album without like changing lineups and stuff and you almost you almost have like a similar thing where you guys are going um, a lot of albums with, with like big things happening. That was probably pretty stressful to have to deal with. It was just a wild ride. Like when when it started, like I don't think that there is anybody that came up the way that we did. And there's like stuff I can't even really like. I don't even know if I can talk about because of like it being illegal and like not like. <laughs> Stuff, but just like stealing to live kind of shit yeah and like stuff like that that like we had to we like our story of how we started and stuff like no i don't i don't know anybody else that 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 did the things that we did to get it going and sacrifice some of the stuff that we did i mean by the end of the band um all of us were living in a small apartment sharing off one hot and ready a day you know what i mean oh and, wow uh, and that was at the end that was after all the big stuff. You know what I mean? 
Uh, and that was nothing compared to the beginning and stuff where, you know, I think when I first started playing with Matt and them, they were all living in a one bedroom apartment, probably six of them in Orlando. And I moved into that one bedroom apartment and joined them. And we would all sleep around the computer on the floor and uh, go just do wild shit to get food and to get money. You know what I mean? And to be able to go on tour and everything was just about being able to get out on the road, whatever you got to do, you know? And it was a, it was a wild time. But uh, that being said, you know, like um, we just had that energy of like, we're going to get it done. Yeah. Nobody's going to, nobody's going to help us. We're going to go do it and take care of it ourselves. And if you're not going to help us get out of the way and that kind of energy, like got us to a lot of places, but it also kept us out. I think of a lot of places because we didn't always know when to tone it down <laughs> or when to, uh, you know what I mean? I think you just like, when you're, when you're kind of like, uh, when you have to do all that stuff to kind of just like get to baseline or like you got it, you're struggling so much to just put gas in the car to go to a show that then is canceled <laughs> and like all this stuff. And I remember the first tour I did with him was like a 30 something day tour and only five shows happened. What? What was <laughs> you like, know? This, how many like States did you go across? So many. And I remember like, on one of these, on one of those early tours, well, I think on that specific tour, Travis broke both of his arms at like a jiffy loop. We were playing a wall ball and he fell and uh, broke both of his arms. And we ended up having to go to this hospital in Virginia. And we just, uh, we had a, one of those power inverters in the van. And so we plugged full cabinets into the cigarette lighter in the van and set up drums in the parking lot of the hospital and played the songs in the parking lot until it was done. And for some reason, nobody called the cops or did anything. It's just a really, but that was like the kind of kids we were, you know what I mean? Like go to the hospital, set up all your gear in the parking lot and play. <laughs> yeah. And I, I can imagine too, like, having that energy in every every exchange you have you're definitely going to run into you, you might run into problems rubbing people oh, the wrong way and in retrospect and stuff too you know like you see kids if i saw kids like us like roll up and then god i'm gonna have to deal with this right now like, oh, <laughs> goes, like i've had i've had that a bunch you where you look back at some of the stuff you've done and you're just like, like you think about it and it was so rad when you were a kid but then if you were an adult around that you're like these kids are the worst yeah dude yeah yeah a hundred percent so uh you know you uh forget what the sorry what the uh the original tie-in was um I was just, uh, I was asking earlier about um, just like, I didn't realize, you know, from being a fan of from first to last, you know, because like, especially your first album, like hit so big, dear, like Dear Diary hit so big and you just have the, and then you listen to that a bunch and it's just this big thing to you. So you just have this perspective like, oh yeah, big rock band, everything's going fine for them. So it's just, it's yeah. always interesting uh, hearing about it where it's like, yeah, no, from the inside though, it's a much rockier ride than you really realize. Oh yeah, yeah, no, a hundred percent. And I think too, a lot of the times, you know, people see maybe like there might be a lot of people at the shows and stuff. Um, and so they'll assume that you're making a ton of money and you totally can in that, in that situation. I think when we were coming up, like I said, everything was happening so fast and we kind of were always just feeling like, well, this is just another step in the process of this. Uh, not thinking that this may, like every step can just be where it stops. Mm -hmm. uh, I think naively I was under the impression it's like, this is just another stop along the way, you know, and that we'll keep going. Uh, like this and you know much to uh, my su <laughs> surprise I guess it, it went a different way than I expected I'm I'm very happy that everything happened the way that it happened and stuff now you know but uh at the time it was just a lot of lessons to learn and certainly like you were saying I, I would have expected for a band our size to be not have a lot of the issues that we did you know but mm -hmm. uh, we, because of the way we looked at things, we pumped a lot of money back into the van and back into the band, invested big into the band to do big things, you know? Uh, and as a result of that, uh, when things sort of stop unexpectedly, you may not have a lot of uh, 
money in reserves because you've been pumping everything back into the business to keep it operating at the scale that you want it to operate at, you know, or to appear the way you want it to appear. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it can be very deceiving, I guess. Okay. I feel that. I feel that. Um, I was curious about, uh, um, with uh if i i, I want to hop into if i die first for a little bit i was curious about that um where what is it you you were saying but you were saying before how you know you tried the nine to five thing and like uh the pandemic sort of uh took took that away and now you're you know you got this i assume you got this like energy and excitement for the fact that you know you, you got the new you got the new band you're in what's it what's the mindset like of starting um not that you necessarily started the very beginning of it but it's in you guys have what like six or seven songs out it's in the pretty early stages of the band what's like the feeling of starting a band during a pandemic and during a time where it's it's semi-illegal to go <laughs> do the thing you want to do yeah you know yeah uh, it's super interesting because I think we're sort of just like everybody is just feeling around right now. Uh, nobody knows what the right way to kind of do a band during this stuff is, you know, and I think everybody's watching what everybody else does and trying to see, you know, when people at the start of the pandemic who had records slated to come out decided to hold uh, it was interesting to see which people decided to hold those and wait and which people decided to release and what happened when to both, you know, watching uh, is, uh, uh, it, you know, did people still talk about this release a couple weeks later without a tour to kind of keep the hype going or are these online virtual concerts working to do that and all that kind of stuff. It's been super interesting to watch. Uh, I, I, I can't say that I have like a, a definite uh, opinion yet you know i think it's still so early but as far as what we've been doing i think it's just been um trying to get sh like show and tour ready now because things do look like they're starting to open up again and starting to kind of um plan for that um trying to continue writing you know uh, it doesn't feel that different i guess from what our normal your normal starting up a, a group uh, of people that are experienced with being in a band and stuff like that, that have toured before and all of that, you know, I, I think it's probably the normal steps you would take, get good material together, uh, practice, get show ready, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, that's pretty much been it so far though. Um, I've only been, I think three or four months I've been involved, you know, so I kind of missed out on the whole, putting the band together part um if you were curious about that I, travis would probably be a great guy to ask about that or, <laughs> you know uh, okay cool no i just i can just imagine like it's uh there's definitely got to be that excitement of when is it time to when are we able to like go out a hundred percent a hundred percent man every you know uh every couple of weeks you hear like oh so-and-so is gonna book a tour for august you think it'll happen you yeah. know <laughs> <laughs> yeah um what's gonna what's gonna happen so um so with um with uh drumming for uh if i die first what's like i'm, I'm, I'm sort of curious like what's sort of your uh mindset in going in because um i like i did that video talking about uh night the nightmare song and you know the thing the thing i always found interesting about your drumming and i noticed it a lot in uh from first to last two is you know playing this sort of like punk emo screamo type music it's not and I, as a, as a drummer myself i notice it it's not like a hot it's not a demanding genre as a drummer <laughs> you know what i mean it's not yeah. a, and and you you seem to really go above and beyond the call of duty on like what what you do during the song but then at the same time not being overly busy not being too much not being like all right we get it you can play some sweet fills like chill out like what what's like your mindset to sort of um sh like kind of show off your skills but still stay in the pocket and not do too much it's just laziness like laziness 
to learn how to do things the right way. Like I've, I, I never had drum lessons or anything. I, I um, uh, like a, a friend of mine who uh, his family, my, this guy, Mike Artunian, his family uh, ran a, a trash disposal business and they would always find drum parts and things in the trash, you know? And uh, eventually they brought over some random pieces of drum sets and stuff and let me have them. And I put together a kit with like two kick drums, uh, one rack tom, a Gatorade cooler with a floor tom head on it, uh, a snare drum and like two cymbals. And then would just sit in my room and try to play like, you know, emperor and cradle of filth on it like all day long and uh and that was how i learned and so i think that style and stuff comes from just growing up listening to lots of metal and loving it but not knowing how to uh not play like a caveman so i'm always hitting everything as hard as i can which takes like a you can't keep that stamina up for doing really really uh precise fast things you know yeah. and so i think like my style is literally a result of just laziness of like, I want to do all of this stuff. Oh, I'm tired. Let's lay back. Let's, you know, or, <laughs> um, that would be the honest answer. I think is just playing around with my own limitations of, you know, so your drumming style has like a very metal influence to it. Yeah. Like I grew up listening, like some really influential drummers to me, uh, were like, um, uh nick barker from cradle of filth the you know the guy that played on like cruelty and the beast and uh the album before that um and uh this guy uh danny that played in uh, all these local bands when i was growing up and i think he ended up playing for exhumed for a long time but he was in this band called uphill battle when i was in high school and another like old crust band called the army of the parasites i think it was the first time i saw him play this kid was like a drum teacher at 16 you know <laughs> yeah one of those like, freaks of nature yeah like a ludicrously talented guy and was a part of the like crust punk grindcore scene which is like where i kind of came like i came of age in la going to shows at the pch club and seeing dystopia and grief and like all of this like doom and crust punk stuff out there and so those were like the drummers that guy in particular was an enormous influence the way he played at such style and finesse and just and was my age so there was no excuse why i shouldn't be able to like go out like that you know and in that type of music that nobody likes <laughs> like you're still killing it and doing all this cool stuff you know so uh, it's uh yeah and so then um when i moved out to florida i was trying to start a black metal band and uh and I met uh, Matt Good on a on a web forum called Lipstick and Cigarettes that was like kind of like makeup club because he had a guitar uh, in the background shot of his profile and, and he lived in the same little suburb as me in Orlando and I was like oh I hit this guy up and do this and started playing with them and that's how Color of Violence started was with me Matt Travis uh, our old bass player Joey and our old tour manager Chad started Color of Violence did a tour for that in like 2002 or 2003 and then uh and then i joined fftl right afterwards and uh and i guess tried to play death metal drums in that pop punk band <laughs> <laughs> is um okay so that's really interesting is like is like sort of um the style like the style of from first to last is that not that's not necessarily your the general style of music you listen to but you kind of like yeah. it, like, I would say that at the time, there were definitely bands uh, that were doing um, stuff in hardcore and emo and stuff that I was really, really into. But I wasn't necessarily, like, following the scene like uh, like that, you know? I yeah. wasn't, I, I called myself an active part of it, you, you know? Okay, um, that's fair. I was more into metal and stuff, but I, I loved that, that uh, the Poison the Well and the Thursday records when they came out. Like, I loved yeah. those. I loved uh, I love that Envy, All the Footsteps You Ever Left, that album. Okay. Uh, and like a lot like a lot of emotional hardcore kind of stuff, Yafik Toto and like all of that stuff. And, and so it's not like I was like uh, not into it, but it just wasn't uh, the scene that I came from, I guess. And pop punk definitely wasn't the scene that I came from, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I remember seeing 
first to last play before I was in a band and kind of getting the chills a little bit, even though I wasn't into that kind of scene and being like, yeah. damn, they got special, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. So, so did they try to, did they try to like push the eyeliner heavy on you or? No, I don't, I don't think I ever really wore much makeup. I think I, I used to do like that little like adamant, like uh, yeah, line. yeah here doing that but i was never a big eyeliner i don't think i ever really wore that for any shoots or anything i feel you know i always i always noticed that because that was the thing i would always laugh about when i would see yeah like the promo shots i'd be like oh yeah they probably did they probably couldn't convince derek to go along with like the the cool guy hair and shit <laughs> is that yeah, like, can i ask an honest question is that like a thing like if if, if you guys were going to play a live show and you showed up in like a green shirt they'd be like we're wearing all black, Derek. Come on, man. <laughs> like, you know, I think like there's certain stuff that like just you'll decide as a band. Like, if you want to come across a certain way and you want to look professional, then people will like be on the same page. It's kind of a dick move to like you. T you talk about all this stuff way ahead. It's usually like doing coordinated stuff on stage is not a day of kind of thing. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It's like. Oh, like what do do we want to have a coordinated look for performances? That's something you take care of before the tour even starts. So like that's, you know, if we weren't into doing something like that, and most of the time we didn't do anything like that. There were very few tours I think where we tried to have a coordinated look. Um, mm -hmm. and it was never a problem because we all agreed on it before it started. You know, that's so. fair. And I'm I'm being funny, but like legitimately, I've had those times, and I I know it might be silly from a fan standpoint, but I'm like. I do like when they look cool. Like, yeah, yeah. Like you want you want your rock bands to look cool. So I will say, like, yeah. as a, people may like clown on dudes who do stuff like that, but it's like, no, 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 no. Like, it's a band. Like, let's have fun with it. Let's look cool. Yeah, I, there's like a level too, right? Of that, like, too cool for everything kind of stuff. It's like people are paying to come see you perform and stuff. Like, you know, like you don't, you can just like be drinking in your underwear on the bus all day and then just walk on stage like that and play and people will still clap and stuff, but you can put a little more effort into it too. And that's okay. You know, I don't know. People always made fun of like fallout boy for doing like the bitch tosses and stuff. And I was just like, I would be like, I know what the songs sound like. Like, let me, like I like a performance. Like I like shit looking cool. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's like why, you know, you can watch the music video or you can watch, <laughs> You can listen to the song to just have a sort of lifeless performance of it, but if first, why not like kind yeah. of hand, get people to be there, you know? You're just in the audience, like, yes, this sounds exactly like the record. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, let me ask you a couple because, like I said, I am a drummer and I did want to ask you a couple nerdy drummer questions. And you were saying before, like, you were. You made the joke saying you were lazy, but I was like, you know, I've watched some live footage and because, you know, you got you can sound tight in the studio, but then you'll see that warp Tour clip and you'll just be like, ah, oh, he, he doesn't got it. But I'm like watching these clips and even that like I was watching old warp Tour clips and like I was impressed with your precision with the double bass and everything. Is that a thing where you just played so much you eventually because I, I I've always been OK at the double bass like I could do like simple breakdowns and stuff. But when I hear some some of the like like you do and other metal drummers do the precision you have is that a thing where you like sit down and you go I'm gonna be practicing double bass to a metronome for this long every day or did it come did it sort of just come to you over just playing a lot? I think like in the beginning because all I cared about playing at the start was metal and fast metal, you know. Um, I like practice that more than anything, just because I wanted to impress the kids in my high school black metal band with how fast I could play or how fast I could do scissor beats or how fa you know, and stuff like that. And so a lot of times I would practice uh, doing the fastest back and forth, like, and then I would try to switch it and do it with my left leg. And then I would, uh, like, you know what I mean? So you mean, are you, t are you saying like, you'd be like, da, 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 starting with your right and then try to start it with your left to sort of, so like, so I would do a single pedal, like a single stroke kind of with, with my right foot and do just a scissor beat, like, and then I would switch and use my left foot as my only foot that I'm using and do the same beats like that with the other foot. 
Gotcha. But I basically get as comfortable with my left leg as I was with my right leg. And then later on, um, like when FFTL was doing like headlining and stuff like that, and when we were at that level, we used to take an extra drum kit on tour. And when we parked for the day, we'd set up a drum kit in the trailer uh, of, our, of the bus, uh, a practice kit that was all muted and stuff. And I would go and like take a book with a headlamp and just do double bass exercises for an hour or two and then do like an hour or so of just like hand and arm exercises. And then kind of do that as like uh, the, the sort of maintenance, I guess, on the road, you know? Oh, uh, okay. Just kind of like that was all, that would be like going into the gym, running on the treadmill or something like that. Yeah, like because it's like uh, you put a lot into playing every day, but it's not necessarily great to just have your only workout be like maximized, you know, maximum push in like twenty something minutes. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. A, a very well rounded like routine or anything. You just kind of go as hard as you can, and so sometimes it's like. I would feel more fatigued or feel really inconsistent uh, on tour. Some days be way more tired than others or blah, blah, blah. So I found that like adding that other routine and helping build up your stamina like that and stuff was very helpful. Uh, mm-hmm. And we also, I played to a click live every show. Really? Yeah. Every show. I remember, dude, I remember starting to do that. When I was in when I was in a band, you really you really uh, expose your flaws when you do that. I remember I was like, "Oh wow, I do speed up all the time." So yeah, I, were you sorry. doing? Were you, no, it's okay. Were you doing that all the time, or was it when the band started getting bigger and you're like, "All right, we might. I I, I want to keep it tighter." I you know, we I have always preferred to play to a click because. I, I get very excited or very into stuff. And if I'm not to a click, we'll be playing everything at 200 BPM live because I'm just too amped up and too hyped. I've seen some videos from when we were touring off aesthetic and the speed that we placed those songs that, you know, it's like you go through a 20 minute EP in nine minutes. <laughs> and it's just like, you know, it's um, so uh, the click, track was very important but then unfortunately you know we didn't use a click when we were writing dear diary so some of the songs have just never worked to a click uh like i think note to self we've never really i mean we could do it by mapping out you know ramping up and down the tempo but then it's really hard to adjust to that live really so uh, you, be- you didn't record it with a click track only certain songs like most of dear diary was recorded to a click but there's a couple songs that have these like tempo changes uh that are kind of baked into the song and so uh, like we didn't realize because we wrote them not to a click you know so you would oh so you would record them all live and because there was the tempo changes you just you just say like no it wasn't yeah like it, it was more about the way the song is written that like you don't realize these parts maybe are different rhythms or something. You put them next to each other and you don't realize that to play them accurately to a click, the second part has to be half speed of what it, the way you wrote it or something. And so it it changed the feel of the song too much to have it all on a consistent tempo. So we just left them not on a click. Oh, wow. That's super interesting. Um, When you guys were doing the, when you guys were, you were saying about uh, practicing for like an hour or two before the shows when you were headlining, how long were your sets at that point? You know, not that long. Um, We never, like, I don't think we ever played longer than an hour, really. Oh, okay. I thought I was, when you said not that long, I thought you meant, I I thought you were going to say less than that. Um, No, I, I, you know, I don't. I'm not sure uh, why, Um, probably because of, um, there was, there was probably a lot of reasons why we, why we didn't play longer. Um, But uh, yeah, I I can't remember any time ever playing longer than like an hour, maybe an hour, 15 minutes, you know? Um, Yeah. Well, the reason I was curious was because did you notice that when you started, um, with the longer sets, did you, did, was that another reason why you sort of had to like build up that endurance? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, but really to me, the reason to do that was to be consistent every day. 
you know because yeah it makes uh, sense. I, I would I would find that like when when we I wasn't rehearsing like that or doing that kind of maintenance work and stuff that I would be I would feel very inconsistent. Some days I would be able to knock everything out of the park, and then the next day uh, my legs would kind of you know not do what I wanted them to, or I would be flubbing on some stuff that I didn't feel like I should be flubbing on, and I couldn't figure out why, you know. And so I think it. Uh, that those extra practices and stuff really help to kind of take care of all of that. Just... Okay. Interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you about, I noticed like in a lot of, in a lot of the songs that you're playing the drums on, uh, the one thing that always stuck out to me was your higher Tom was always tuned up a little bit louder than I would hear in like most bands, like say from first to last or whatever. Is that, does that come from like your metal drumming influence? Cause it just seems like to have the higher pitched Tom seems like a, a metal thing or whatever. You know, like people probably hate to hear this from a drummer, but like, I never, I don't know. I, I, I can't, I don't even know how to tune my drums to be honest with you. <laughs> Not probably like, I don't it never has felt like that important to me. Like, I just want to go and just like beat the hell out of everything and just like, whatever. Like if I can get them to sound okay by just like, sort of finger tightening lugs and then doing a half turn then that's cool with me like i don't you know or like if the engineer that we're working with wants to tune it to the key of the song or whatever that's cool with me too i don't really care i just want to i don't have a preference i guess is my oh okay my, so like you're pretty like in the studio when recording you're pretty easy going with like the sound and stuff yeah yeah like like i may i may you know obviously if stuff sounds like ridiculous <laughs> like, <laughs> like that kind of stuff. But, um for the most part as long as it sounds like that type of drum you know i'm cool with it uh i just want to like to me it's more i i'm more focused on performing the thing right and doing a good job than okay. like you know Cool. Yeah, I always, I always just thought that like the tuning of your drums kind of just was a little thing that ma made your shit stick out a little bit more. So, I you know, I I, it's possible too. And like, I, I, I say that I don't care about that stuff so much, but you know, there we've always like um, Travis has always been a very um, producer minded band member too, you know, and has always been very in touch with how he wants things to sound how the tones that he wants to get out of the recordings and stuff and so there's no doubt that a lot of that has to do with his influence and how you know he heard the drum recording sounding and stuff like that because he's uh, always thinking about that side and i don't really think about that stuff very much, <laughs> very much. <laughs> nice um hell yeah um yeah i hope i'm like questions all right and not just no, like trim no. No, 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 no. My next, my <laughs> next, my next one's just super nerdy, and I'm, I was getting self conscious about it. No, I was gonna say with like hardcore drumming and whatnot. Do you ever, do, do you ever have like a like when playing breakdowns? Do you ever have a preference versus like the ride symbol versus crash symbol? Because I remember I started noticing a lot more dude when I first started. A lot more dudes were going like way harder on the ride symbol, and I like learned playing in the jazz band and stuff. And I remember being like, "You don't do that to that. That's for the crash symbol." <laughs> But then I was just like, I was like, the more I started playing the drums, I was like, no, you can kind of like create this cool, this cool wider, because like a crash cymbal is a lot more thinner. The ride cymbal can have this like wider tone when playing breakdowns. Oh, yeah. I love to, uh, Zildjian has, makes a great crash ride, you know, and it's built just for that. Yeah. Uh, for fat warm wash of tone you know uh and so yeah yeah I, I to me it's like there's a part of me that always wants to hear like a cheesy kind of like really quick uh china or splash or something when you're doing a breakdown or some really quick high end you know yeah. uh, um but yeah i don't know the crash rides are a lot of fun man they're a lot of fun to play with if you uh if you had haven't, haven't messed with one of those the Zildjian crash rides, I definitely recommend it. Oh yeah, well you can see back here. I got the electric kit, and this is like oh all right. 
Yeah, so I'm like getting – I haven't drummed in probably – I haven't played the drums in like five or six years. So in the past couple months, I've been getting back into it. And now I'm just like, oh, I miss real drum sets now. <laughs> yeah, I know, man. I've had a couple of friends that have let me play in their electronic kits over the years. And it's so much fun, like, with being able to kind of put live drums on recordings right on the spot. But I can never get over the feel, how different the feel was. And I would always worry that, like, if I get too used to playing this kit, then when I have to go out and play another one, it's, it's going to be like, it's going to take me longer to get comfortable again or get back into it because it's so, such a completely different feeling, you know? Yeah. It's, I have, um, I have like the mesh heads, the kit with the mesh heads and they're, they're different. They're actually, it's actually easier. So it is, it, it, it you kind of almost like you're playing with a handicap a little bit, but I'm just, I just live in a, I just live in an apartment complex. So I'm not trying, I'm more doing the electric kit to not be a dickhead. Eventually when I get a basement or whatever, I'll go back to, I'll go back to acoustic. Um, when you're, uh, when you're playing, like when you're playing these big shows where you get uh mic'd up, you know, you, they have to like mic up mic up the drums and stuff. Does like the size does like the size of your bass drum really matter at that point? I mean, it does I guess for the tone, you know. Yeah. I don't know. I I I tend to like kind of small tighter kits. Okay. And always kind of have i think if you look through too it's super funny some of the old fftl pictures and stuff you used to play this tiny little pork pie kit uh like a i think a, a four-piece pork pie kit okay. you know like a inch kick uh like 12 inch tom or 10 inch tom or something and a 14 inch floor tom or something just like a really tiny kit we'd show up to these shows and then just like be playing this crazy stuff on like a little toy looking kit you know Interesting. Interesting. Um, I wanted to, so, oh wait, I'm looking through my questions. I wanted to ask, oh yeah. So you were talking about touring earlier. Is, is warp tour as brutal as everyone says it is? It, it can be, especially if you're doing it in a van. <laughs> <laughs> I've, but it's such a, you know, I feel like too, when you're, a young band and you go out and do it it's so like such a magical kind of thing and it's probably your first experience with something that crazy and wild and stuff it's i don't think it you, you really mind we didn't really mind like you'll complain about it because you know you're in it all day but in like when you look back on it and stuff like it was brutal but it was so much fun you know what i mean yeah that makes uh, I'm sorry to cut you oh, off. Oh no no no! I was just gonna say that make that makes sense where it is like it's kind of brutal, but the experience it seems like the experience from it and stuff is like you know the re the the, the thing you're looking for. Yeah yeah, there's like nothing else like it. You know, <laughs> it's like uh, it, it's bizarre. Uh, like Groundhog Day every day. You know, you're in a different state, but you're in a sports arena that looks exactly like the same place or just a fairgrounds that looks like the same place with all the same people <laughs> doing all the same stuff every day. Everything's just a little bit different, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. Which parking? Stuff in spring which, and yeah, all. which giant field are we going in today? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, like, there's just something about when you have like 50 buses next to each other at night, you know, after the show's all over and everybody's just hanging out waiting for bus call. And it's like a, a super, it's like the ultimate uh, backstage, <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah. 50 bands at once all just partying backstage every night, you know? Mm. Um, with, uh, and uh, we'll, I've asked about all the questions I want to ask. So thank you very much. And uh, we can wrap this up in a minute, but I, I want to ask a little bit more about before we get out of here about if I die first. And yeah. you, were, you were saying you live, um, you and Travis live right next door yeah. to each other. Yeah. Do um, so I'm, I'm curious about, do you, does the, do the other members of the band live near you guys or cause I'm curious uh, about, I'm curious about what like the songwriting process is right now right um well um they're close but not like neighbor close you know um but we're all we're none of us are very far from each other um and uh we get together um a couple i mean 
there's three solo artists in the band too, you know? So sometimes everybody has a lot going on, yeah. I guess. And so we get together, I think, as much as we can. And, you know, uh, I know that all of the guys contribute to songwriting. I'd probably say that I'd consider Ned to be the principal songwriter um, for, for the music. Uh, and then uh, that's not to say he's the only person writing, but I'd say principally, you know, uh, I think everybody leans on Ned to set the tone and direction for the song and, you know, and then uh, everybody add their parts in and throw their color into it. But that's only been my experience so far. You know, who knows how it'll um, change in the future as well. Okay, um, interesting. I, like, I don't want it to sound like everybody doesn't add all of their own things. Everybody writes a lot and contributes a lot. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But no, yeah. I, I've, I've, I definitely, I've had that with bands in before where it's like, you know, you know who sort of like starts, like, like you know, strikes the match and then everyone else hops exactly. in to, to make the final product. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I, I feel like, you know, everybody would agree, like that sort of Ned is the, is the, uh, the guy that gets everything going, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so to, to finish up the interview, I'm just curious where, you know, like you were saying before, I saw, you know, you guys just had a sweet merch drop. You've been dropping videos a whole bunch, which I think has been a huge help for you guys just with the regularity of like content and stuff. And, um, yeah. and then you're talking about wanting to go out on tour. What's, uh, what, what do you guys see coming up for if I die first in the, the next uh, year and so? I mean, definitely, uh, you know, we'll definitely be playing shows before the end of the year. Um, and hopefully if things work uh, the way that it seems like they're going to, then hopefully, you know, uh, by the fall, we'll be able to start doing stuff. But um, it's hard to stay in the age of COVID because so much stuff uh, is in the air indefinitely, you know, and so much stuff is subject to change. Uh, that's what we're planning on is being able to go out and play some shows by the fall. Um, everything continues going the way that it's going now. Okay. Awesome. Well, I'm excited. I'm excited for you guys to come out on tour. I've been loving the music. Uh, yeah. You guys have been crushing it. So very excited for all that to happen. Derek, uh, it's been my absolute pleasure. I really appreciate you taking time out of your Sunday to let me ask you some questions. Uh, thank you so much, man. Let them know where they yeah. can uh, find you on social media and whatnot. Oh God. That's yeah. It might be easier to link. I don't even know. I, I my, uh, Instagram is God underscore love. <laughs> <laughs> I'll throw it in and the then, description. <laughs> yeah. My, Better is just don't even bother, you know. Like I don't. It's like you underscore R. Under, it's just too much. Um, <laughs> and then it's a I, really, I really appreciate you having me on. It was a total pleasure talking to you. And hopefully, I didn't uh, totally, you know, just butcher every answer, wow. running off on unrelated tangent. Fucking, <laughs> you fucking, you fucking crushed it, bro. You fucking crushed it. <laughs> you man and hopefully uh maybe we'll do one again soon with i was telling uh me and travis were talking i was saying that i, I noticed you had a twitch channel i wish you uh played some games on pc so you could jump in with me and travis on left for dead oh so that, well i gotta get a better pc I, I i downloaded apex recently and my computer almost exploded it's i have a i have a horrible pc so that's oh, why gonna, that's why i've been mainly keep what? in mind left Left 4 Dead came out in like 2008 or something, so you should be able to run it pretty easy. Oh, uh, well, okay. Uh, I'll check it out. I I miss playing Left 4 Dead. I didn't even think that it's on PC. It, uh, Left 4 Dead 2, they just issued a new update for the game with new like 20 new uh, survival maps and stuff and a bunch of other stuff like last month. Okay. Which one's that? Left 4 so Dead 2? Yeah. I think it's like five bucks on Steam. Oh, but okay. if you... If your computer can run it, let me know. I'll gift it to you. You can play with us. We play almost every day. Oh, okay. Hell yeah. I would love, yeah. I, pro I mean, what did you say? Oh, wait, it probably can run it. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh <laughs> <laughs> At least, like, I ran it on medium settings on, like, a 2007 MacBook or something. <laughs> like All right. Yeah, I could, I could probably play that shit. <laughs> probably. 
get it working, dude. Hell yeah! Uh, I'll hit I'll hit you up with my uh my uh my Steam shit, and we can fucking play together and shit. Yeah, get me on uh on Twitter, and I'll add you on there. Hell yeah, I'll man! See- Thank you so much. Yeah, of course, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have a good one, bro. Yeah, you too. Peace. Bye.